From lifestyle, fitness, beauty, travel, relationships, and self-care, Steph's got you covered. Welcome to your safe space, where you can stop what you're doing, relax, and let someone else do the heavy lifting for once. This is the Luxury Dropout Podcast with your host, Stephanie Joplin. What's up, fellow dropouts? Welcome back to the Luxury Dropout Podcast with me, Stephanie Joplin. Today, I have an amazing woman standing by, by me. Standing by me, she is actually one of. I would say she's one of my mentors in life. She is a person that I look to for grace, poise, how to react to drama, how to overcome obstacles, how to work together in a relationship when you're in a high profile relationship where people are in your business a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I want to introduce you to Megan Olivi. Hi, oh my God, I'm not crying, you're crying. (laughs) That about? was so oh, nice. I have thank you. It feels nice. It feels nice. Um, <laughs> so Megan, for those of you who don't know, and you have to know who she is. I mean, her face is so recognizable, no. and obviously she's Italian, <laughs> so like. 10 points, right? right 10 right, points for Griffin Ward right there. <laughs> uh, so she's a host. She's a reporter for UFC on ESPN. She also reports for the NFL uh, with Fox. Yep. And um, she she's a sideline reporter for NFL with Fox. And she's been doing this for the past decade plus. I actually watched, okay, I actually watched you, one of your first interviews oh, with no. Joseph. Oh, WC. For WC. And you're like, I'm here with Joseph, the beefcake of Benavides. <laughs> and I'm like dying. Yeah. Because you're a baby. Oh, I know. We you're both like, were. Hello. Uh-huh. Um, and you know, you're, you're assertive, but you're still just like baby Megan. And, and it's really cute. Oh, yeah. And we were date. We had already yeah. been dating for a while at right, that point. Right. But we didn't necessarily, like the people who needed to know knew, but not maybe the of masses. Course, of course. And so I remember being so awkward, like, okay, we have to like not, I don't know why we thought it was important to hide it because it's. We actually, I would too. yeah, it was really weird, but, and we met well before I was even mm-hmm. doing that for a living, right. but I remember just being like, okay, like, but we couldn't hide it. Like our smile, yes. we were so flirty and oh uh, yeah, yes, baby he Megan. was so flirty. With you. <laughs> I was like, he loves you uh-huh. yeah, for real. <laughs> um, so I want to go back to the beginning. Um, you grew up on the East coast yeah, and then you went to college. Um, it was at, was it Seton? Yeah. Seton okay. Hall. Yep. And then you went for your master's at Fordham yeah. and you did that in two semesters. Yeah. I'm insane because basically I lived in New York city, which is not, not cheap. Right. I had a 300 square foot apartment, which is literally um, smaller than this hotel room. Right. I lived on the fourth floor, no elevator, no air conditioning. Like it was insane. And I could barely afford it. It was so much money. Right. And I just knew that my education was going to be important to me in terms of what I wanted to do. I decided to go into broadcasting very late in my college career. Mm -hmm. I wanted to manage political campaigns. Okay. So I went for political science. I was like gung ho about that. And I was always just talking to whoever was around me about sports. Mm -hmm. And so they were like, well, you should do that for a living. I'm like, yeah, no, I'm not that vain. Yeah. You know, I kind of like had this really bad. That's for someone else. Yeah. Yeah. And, And I had this bad misconception that like, you must be unintelligent and it must be just based on your looks or like Mm -hmm. special friends and that kind of Mm -hmm. stuff. And so I really just felt like that, that wasn't for me, but then as I actually learned about it and I, it was 100% on me that, you know, pre preconceived notions. Once I learned about it, I was like, this is really something that it, it's that whole, you don't work a day in your life if yes. you follow your passion. Yes. And while it was still very challenging, I was like, you know what, there's also a million people who want to do what I want to do. Mm-hmm. And now they have a leg up because they have a degree in that they have years of training in that specific field they want to go into. And so uh, I think it was the end of my junior year. I was like, okay, I'm, I'm going to need to get my master's. So I, I took the like, GREs. Yeah. Got in. I was really fortunate to get into all the schools I wanted to, but Fordham um, was a Catholic university. It's a very prestigious university. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, Yeah. and I I just wanted to continue. You know, I've gone to Catholic school since I was in nursing school all the way through. So I was like, you know what? We got to finish this out with the Jesuits. Um, (laughs) Right. So I did it. And and they they actually let me, I worked full time. They let me count my job because it was in broadcasting. They let me count that as a class. And then I just- I like never slept. It was crazy. I would sleep like three hours a night and that's how I was able to finish. Um, But I graduated with honors. So I'm like, what? (laughs) Excuse me, hair flip. 
So when you graduated, I, I know that you were offered a job and moved to Vegas, but what job was that? Yeah. So it was with heavy MMA. Okay. So essentially my brother was a very accomplished wrestler. My yes. grandfather was a boxer yes. and, and I was dating Joe. And so you were already dating Joe. On yeah. Coast? Yeah. So we were like kind of long distance dating. Well, okay. I wouldn't say seriously dating on his end. Okay. okay. <laughs> well, I know he asked for your email yeah. address. So uh-huh. it date, yeah. dates us a little yeah, bit. Yeah. Yeah. So we were like, we would Skype all the time. We talk on the phone all the time. And then, you know, it's, it's challenging to live in New York um, when you don't make a lot of money. Mm-hmm. And so the job offer in Las Vegas was for a little bit more money, but yeah. for way less of a cost of living. It was closer to this guy yes. I really liked. And I thought, well, I'll give myself one year. Yeah. If I don't succeed in a year or I hate it, I can just move back and go exactly back to the same position I'm in. But let me try. And so I never moved back. I, yeah. I went to Vegas and it was with heavy and I really kind of cut my teeth there. Uh-huh. They, before the TV deal with the, the UFC, they did the official pre and post show for pay-per-views. Got it. So I was essentially hired to, to help co-host those pre and post shows with a guy named Dave Farah, who I still love and adore and, and appreciate to this moment. Um, but yeah, that's, that's kind of how I like learned on the job. I was doing yeah. stuff in grad school and doing stuff in internships, but it's, it's not the same okay. when you're like interviewing Brock Lesnar, of you course. know, just going down a, a row yeah. of interviews and you're just like, Oh, well, yeah, of course. No, yeah. So like, yeah, that's, that's where I really like cut my teeth and, and learned on the job, you right. know, some great moments, some not great moments. <laughs> yes, of course. So, so how did you meet Joe? Like, through, was it through MMA? So my two best friends and I went to Las Vegas okay. when we graduated college okay. and, um, we ran into this group of guys in the lobby of the Mandalay Bay. Oh my God. Yeah. And, uh, Throwback. <laughs> yeah. And they, they were like, do you want to go to, I want to say it was like Trist or something. Yeah. yeah. Like, do you want to go to Trist? Something and we're like 22 school. years old with yeah. no money. We're like, sure. Yeah. So we went there. Cause they were like, Oh, we, we like don't have to pay to get in and mm-hmm. whatever. So we went and Joe is sober. So he, um, he doesn't drink. And so we were just kind of chatting the whole night. Mm-hmm. And then he was making me laugh, quoting Will Ferrell. Cool. We ate hamburgers after he's like, do you want to go get food? I'm like, yeah. So me You're and him. Speaking and his, my yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, I do. I'm like, oh, you want to feed me? I'm <laughs> in. And then at the end of the night, he's like, oh, can I have your email? I'm That's like, so sure. Cool. Yeah. Can have your aim. <laughs> like, I know. Right. I know. But he had just gotten a computer and he yeah. said, I seemed very professional. Oh, yes. So that's why he was like, you know, you were. Oh, an email I girl. love that. Yeah. yeah. But you were all, but he obviously had already been practicing MMA at that point in time. Yeah. You had, you came from a wrestling and boxing background with your yeah. family. You were probably, or were you already into MMA, like reporting no, MMA at the time? No. Okay. So he was already in the WEC. I remember him being stopped for autographs and I was like, wait, what? Who that guy? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was yeah. like, what? Cause we had, he was with like a few of his teammates and yeah. one of those teammates was Uriah. And I remember we all thought. So he, team Alpha Male was like at his inception probably. Yeah. Yeah. yeah yes, exactly. Yeah. And we were like, oh, they must, maybe they're like surfers. Yeah. Like, they, we, I mean, it looks like it. Yeah. We were Uriah like, I don't know, like, they're very tan. Yeah. It's, this is like long hair. Thing. Sure. Yeah. So we we're like, yeah, I don't know what's happening, but <laughs> that's fine. And um, and I remember him being stopped for autographs, and I was like, what do you do? He's like, oh, and he's very he, to this moment, he's very bashful about what he does. Oh. He'll lie to people. He'll be like, oh, I'm like a um a Spanish soap opera star, or like he'll just <laughs> he make stuff be. up. He's totally good. <laughs> I know. Yeah. yeah. So I was just like, wait, what? And it's funny because I started going to WCs with Joe. Okay. That's sort of how um, people started to get to know me because mm-hmm. I was doing work in broadcasting television and really the internet, mostly I shouldn't yes. say television, really the internet. Yes. And I was doing, but I was doing work in sports there. And so mm-hmm. people would be like, Oh, you have experience on camera and you're like understanding this and you're associated with Joe, like you, you must know what's going on. And that's, so I kind of got my foot in the door because I was going to these events with him. Like he would fly me. He'd be like, Oh, there's a WC in Denver. Like, do you want to come? And he would fly me. Okay. Then like, we would go meet there um, and hang out and get to have like great meals and just like honestly great last like we I remember watching Step Brothers on a laptop because mm-hmm. like we wanted to watch it together you know Aww. just really like wholesome stuff yeah um and that's sort of how I got introduced to the guys at Heavy and that's how they brought mm-hmm. me on was okay. like oh we've seen her around she, got it. she's young and like willing to do the work and yeah let's bring her in and see how and it goes. They, wow that worked out real well for yeah <laughs> I mean, talk about fate, right? <laughs> yeah. Wow. Well. Okay. Yeah. I wanted to know, cause I, I heard, I, I've heard how you met Joe, but I didn't know how you got 
to Vegas, yeah. like that whole story. Yeah, so. everyone kind of just assumes we met in an interview. I'm like, oh no, I already loved him when I oh, him. I yeah. love it. I love it so much. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay, so um, let's see. What do I want to talk about first? There's so much stuff I want to talk I love about. That you took notes. I Dude, oh she's yeah, like, she's so good. Like, oh. <laughs> the, I know that your podcast is for you to interview other people, but the fact that like you are also listening is a skill that many people who've done this for years don't possess because that's oh, the number you. one thing is mm-hmm. you just listen. Yes. If you can just listen to a person and what they're actually saying and react to that, that's huge. And like you're between your podcast voice <laughs> and your research and your listening skills. Oh, I'm can't breathe. Be successful. I can't breathe right now. <laughs> oh, oh <my. laughs> uh, no, but you know, what's funny is whenever I was interviewing um, fighters, you know, back when I was doing that, they would forget that they were in an interview. And that's what made my interview so good because they would say shit that they would never usually say. And because we were just chatting on the phone and they would forget that they were being recorded and they would say some bullshit about Dana or they would say (laughs) something else. And then I would, I would post it online and then it would just be picked up by like um, underground or like picked up by, you know, I mean, whoever, and it just like would go viral. And then it's like, you know, the headlines, like so-and-so says they hate Dana White. And then like Dana's like tweeting about it. And I'm like, oh, okay, well this worked. Yeah. You know, so that's a skill. You're right. You have to really listen and go with the flow of the interview yes. and not just be thinking about your next question. A hundred percent. That's like the key to success, honestly. Yes. yes. Well, you thank you. It. That's amazing feedback. Um, <laughs> and I, I watch Megan all the time and, um, I, you know, even though we're friends, like when I see her reporting, I'm just like, she's my friend and she's so good. Like she's like, that's my friend. Friend. Like, <laughs> thanks. Yeah. You know, the goal is to make people proud and to make them yeah. like I think that for me at least in the way I was raised it's about like yes wanting to make people proud but also like like showing like hey we did this the right way and yes. like it's not like you know I'm not posting like some crazy shit on my Instagram or like That's, you know yeah. getting to stuff in a in a way okay. that my dad would be like what are you doing this you is know? what I wanted to talk about I'm glad you segue to that yeah because I want to talk about this stigma of women in sports and quid pro quo and the you know like because I suffered with that I suffered with that so much and I have to tell you you probably don't know this about me but I quit because I got so bullied so relentlessly by the community here in Houston MMA <sighs> And they were like, she's this guy, she's this guy, she's like literally Derek Lewis, who's fighting on the card yeah. tonight. He walked me to my car one night in downtown Houston, which is a little sketch. Sure. Literally just walked me to my car after a weigh in or something like that. He wasn't fighting on the card. And the next morning, my editor called me for Legacy at the time for Legacy FC. And he's like, Are you Derek? And I'm like, Excuse me? Wow. Yeah. Just out like that. And he's like, I just want to know because I'm trying to protect you because people are talking. And I'm like, absolutely not. He walked me to my car. Right. Like I appreciate it's in downtown that. Houston. Right. But, you know, according to everyone else, we were sleeping together. It's definitely like, you know, it's, it's a difficult thing. I, th- I feel like I'm lucky at this point now because everyone knows, like, especially all the fighters, yeah. like love and respect Joseph yeah. so much that they know that that's never the case with me. However, you still get those comments. Like basically what happens every time I interview someone, especially with a bigger fight, Mm -hmm. is that I either hate them or I must be sleeping with them. Mm. Like there's like every time I interview Connor, oh my God, she she was so much nicer to Dustin or, oh my God, they must have this thing going on. And it's challenging for for me. And it used to be a lot more bothersome. Now I'm just kind of like, okay, those are people who really don't know because, you know, there's a lot of, I think things that could be improved upon in the MMA community, a lot Mm -hmm. of things, especially behavior online. Um, But I think like for the voices that matter, you know, everybody is like, oh my God, like what? Um, But (laughs) it is, it's a challenging space. And there, I would be lying if I didn't say that there were days where, you know, you can let those voices with the, with the just random icon as their profile get to you or, or say things where you're like, why are you even bringing like, why would you even think of that? But it's kind of, I don't use Twitter really anymore. And yeah. I kind of, people I got are away like, from Twitter too. yeah. And I, you know, I've, I, it's been years since I read a comment on a video because yeah. there's nothing to come from that, but it, it is, <laughs> it's a, it's a challenging space and it's a small community and it's still a relatively new community and it's a young community. Uh. And I think that unfortunately that lends itself to not always a healthy community. I think also there's 
there's a lot of fight fans, right? But there's not very many educated fight fans. They just want to see the blood and yeah. the brawl. And they don't really know like the actual chess match that is MMA because it is chess. Yeah. Picking your moves. Yeah. And think it's it's hard because like you're not only moving your body, but you're thinking so hard in your head. I can barely breathe and walk at the same time. <laughs> right. right? Yeah. Like how do these guys do this? So um especially, you know, with I guess what what I want to say, I lost my train of thought. Well I was but, I was ooh. just gonna say off of that is like I think I think that's why I'm really proud to be a part of this broadcast yes. team because we have like John Anik and Daniel Corbett and of course Joe Rogan, but yes. they, I feel like have really brought a new layer to what you're watching if you're at home and yes. really like explain Educate. stuff. Yeah. And especially when you have a guy who's a two-time Olympian, a two-time, two-division world champion for the UFC and Daniel Cormier, where he can really like break things down in like a fun way yes. that people understand. And they start to kind of get a little bit more of that sport. And then for me, you know, the storytelling end is like where, you know, I'm not going to give the X's and O's, not that I can, it's just that that's not my role. So to be able to like tell the human side, because oftentimes I think we do this in all sports is we forget athletes are human beings yes. and we're just kind of like oh like there's a meme going around right now because it's the olympics and it's like a guy laying on the couch like covered, yeah. covered in chips Chunk kind of food. being like oh my god that was so bad that was so they must be so embarrassed yeah. you know yeah and i think that that we do that with sports i mean mm-hmm. i'm even guilty of it like i'll be watching baseball I'm like how the fuck do you yeah. strike out like yeah. that you know and yeah. like who am i yeah but i, I think know. i think that's like important to to really to do across all avenues mm-hmm. of sports is to remind the viewer and not that the viewer is like not smart enough to remember that, but sometimes you get so involved and wrapped up yeah. in, in a competition that just remind the viewer, like these are human beings with like real stories mm-hmm. and they still have to go home regardless of the outcome and try and like, you know, just put it together for the next day. Absolutely. So it's, it's, there's, you know, we're trying to like make those um, strides within our, our sport of MMA to make sure that like fans have at least that and they, maybe think twice before they have a negative mm-hmm. uh, thought or a comment or a post or whatever it may be. It's not going to mm-hmm. stop it, but maybe it will like lend itself to a little more detail of the story. Yeah. I mean, like, say, like with the Connor and Dustin fight just recently, you know, it was evident that Connor had injured himself really early and people are so mad and people are like, you, you did this on purpose to get the pay-per-view money. No, <laughs> Right. No, nobody is injuring themselves on purpose, guys. No, like that is not a thing. No, it definitely isn't. <laughs> and it's like, and for us, it's like, oh my God, it's like the worst thing you can possibly see. Of course. You're, like, no matter what, that's what you, you don't want to see. Even though you yeah. know it's a fight. Yes. You just don't. It's weird to know yeah. that the, an injury of that magnitude or of a Chris Weidman magnitude or something oh my happens. Lord. You're just like, Ugh. yeah. Oh, and I couldn't even watch the replay. I was, they kept playing. I was like, no, guys. There's a mm-hmm. clip of me no. backstage that he's just like no. screaming because no. I couldn't watch it. I could, yeah, no, I, I scream too. I audibly scream. Um, I was at, I think I forgot what card it was, but I was at the Weidman Silva one. Yeah. Um, I want to say it's 148, but I yeah. think that was Weidman Silva two. Yeah. Yeah. And it was so, and it was when Weidman dethroned him. And so, and then the very next, oh my gosh, the very next time I saw yeah. it, I was like, okay his leg's not supposed to go that no that way that yell will haunt my dreams yes <laughs> so what do you say to you know why why is it that we still we, we have people like you know Aaron Andrews and Rachel Nichols and we have people like um you know Jen Brown and yeah. stuff like that that are doing well in their industries and and you know taking the lead for women in in journal sports journalism but why don't we see more of that still is it because women are, are are hesitant or is it because there's some sexism still going on? What do you think? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, first of all, I have to say like Aaron, I don't know Rachel at all, but Aaron and Jen are just absolutely wonderful. Mm -hmm. And so they're as talented as they are kind and generous with their time, Mm -hmm. which I absolutely love. I don't know. I think, I think it's getting better, Yeah, but I definitely think like things are, it's, it's about how many spots there are and how many opportunities there are how can you separate yourself? Because I think that is a big one. How, what makes you different on the sidelines of the, of X mm-hmm. than all these other letters of the alphabet. Mm-hmm. And I do think that they've all done a really great job of kind of separating themselves and being the leaders of the pack in terms of talent and yeah. innovation in their fields. Yeah. And I think that's what it is. I think there's like an incredible generation of women in sports, especially like I get so many messages all the time from girls who are in high school and college or women who are in high school and college saying like, Hey, I want to, 
I want to do this. And this is like, they already have YouTube channels or they have like a whole Instagram devoted to it. And wow. like, who was doing that when we were in high school and college? None of us. Incredible. Right. So I think that there, it definitely is like a positive trend. Okay, good. I just think, you know, it's relatively new and, and not, not that we don't have supportive male colleagues. Cause we do like, okay. I have That's to good say, to know. yeah, I have to say like, I, work with some of the best in the industries between MMA and NFL. And it, it's, it's really like great to hear, but I think, you know, it's just sometimes roles are limited. You know, we have women calling football now on Amazon, but it wasn't until just what, two years ago mm-hmm. or last year. And so that's relatively new because they didn't have the opportunity, not that they couldn't do it, but it's like, where's that home yeah. for, for them? You know? Yeah. So I think it's just about as, as the world of broadcasting and communications grow, I think there's a lot more roles for women. And, and I always like to say, like, I have my job, not because I'm a woman, but because I'm the best one for it. Of course. And I don't normally have like that braggadocious thought about myself in any other regard. I know that's hard for you to say. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> exactly. But it's like, you know, it's been brought up to me like a few times in these big scrums we do before pay-per-views. And it's mm-hmm. like, wait, no, I wasn't. I wasn't given this job and I certainly wasn't allowed to stay just because of my gender. It's because like, hey she's really the best one for the job. And like, all right, like she's earned this and this is how we go forward. Yes. And I like to think like, that's, that's kind of how the UFC operates is every person who's in their role is really the best one for it. And yeah. then, you know, we just kind of hope that we see that direction in every other sport. So what would you, the, the young ladies who slide into your DMs and, <laughs> yeah. and they're asking yeah. you for advice, what kind of advice do you give them? Well, I would just say like, number one, always be true to yourself and like, don't take a shortcut. That is my absolute (laughs) biggest thing, because I'm not saying you have to like, go get your master's, right? Like that works for me. And I'm a big believer in education, but it's maybe not for everybody, but you will see people get ahead quicker than you because Mm -hmm. they take a route that maybe you won't lay down at night feeling good about. And, you know, for me, it's been a long road. It's still a long road. Like when I do football, I'm the lowest man on the totem pole, but it's like, I'm working for it. Like (laughs) there will never be a time where I ever feel upset or ashamed of how I behaved or how I got somewhere. Right. And I think that it's easy when you're young to be like, well, I need money or I, I, I don't want to like get coffee or just do this like lame internet thing or whatever. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? You can kind of like, because of social media, you see this glamorous world and you think it's like right at your fingertips. And well, you see the tip of that iceberg and not all the work that goes on under it. So when you see somebody maybe making choices that have them skip the line a bit, Mm -hmm. it can be tempting to do that as well. Um, You know, I, I, I take a lot of pride in the fact that I've never really even felt that temptation, but I've also never made a choice that like, I didn't feel good about. Um, But I think for young people in the industry, it can be something that, that kind of like, uh, you know, especially with the world of Instagram, you, you want to be able to like get the followers or the likes or the, Oh my God, I want, I want to be able to go to that event or whatever it is, but it's never worth it. Mm -hmm. It's never worth it because I've seen lots of people come and go and it just, it, you tell on yourself at the end of the day, when you do that, that's true. Yeah, Yeah. that's very true. And in terms of being shy, say in being shy in front of the camera, (laughs) um, coming up with stuff to say on the fly, I, I always kind of have lived by the fake it till you make it. Oh, a hundred percent. That's my life motto. Okay. Okay. I'm like, me too. (laughs) A hundred percent. Yeah. Well, because if you're like super comfortable in front of the camera to begin with, then it's not about, it's not about the person you're interviewing. It's about you. Right. And that's not the goal of somebody who's, you know, whose dream it is to interview an athlete or a celebrity or whatever. Cause it's not supposed to be about me. It's (laughs) I'm just the vessel to get the message out. Correct. So I just fake it half the time. I am terrified. (laughs) Like there are times when I'm doing a live hit and maybe it's like my seventh memorized report of the night. And I kind of forget like, oh shoot, I know I have to get to this destination. And I want to mention this, but I kind of forget the Mm -hmm. path I was going to take. You just, you just keep calm and go with it. I mean, it was, it took a long time to like perfect that art of like, don't panic in the moment, Uh but that's what it is. Just fucking fake it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's definitely been times where I just blank out and I'm just like, uh, my brain completely just went away. Oh yeah. I don't know where that went. Oh yeah. It happens to the best of us, but it's also when you kind of humanize it, people at home, like don't think twice. Like, Oh, I do that all the time. Or like, if you go, if you stutter and you say like, Oh, excuse me, I mean this. No, literally it doesn't even, yeah, it doesn't. And it's when you kind of have that meltdown because you want to be perfect. Mm. That's when people notice because you can't, 
you, there's just no time you're ever going to be perfect on live TV. And practice makes perfect, right? Too. Oh yeah. I would yes. definitely, what, get in front of the mirror. Yeah. If you have yeah. no camera at home, Interview right? Interview friends and family. Just yeah. Whatever it can reps. take, like just absolutely reps and like practice intros. Like that was a big thing for me was like, I couldn't really practice a lot of interview stuff, but I could practice making sure I was introducing the person as mm -hmm. best that I could right. or, you know, and so I think that's like a big, a big thing, like just reps are king. And if, if that means you just do like a little local, I don't know, YouTube yeah. show for a little while, like who cares? Right. Just get the reps in, like get practice. Nobody is going to be like, you can't have this job 10 years later because you were on YouTube <laughs> to start like, no, right. that's great. Yeah, absolutely. I definitely never, I mean, I never did YouTube or whatever before I started doing MMA interviews and I just got literally thrown into it at a legacy fight one time. And they're like, here, interview this guy. And I'm like, I don't even know his name, <laughs> but okay. We've got just, that Italian like yeah. speaking charm where yeah. it's just like we can strike up a conversation with anyone. Like, what's this guy's name? We just have the battle. Yeah. yeah. Did like, he win? Oh I'm my like, god, guy. This is literally right at the beginning when I was like, you know, I'm like, who's cute in the room? Like, right? Like right at the very I was like this in my mid-20s. I didn't know what I was doing. Right, yeah. Who um, does? But then, but then of course you start paying attention and you start getting really into the fights, and which I want to talk to you about getting sure. really into the fights. Okay. I know that when Joseph fights, that you go away. Mm -hmm. and you say your prayers except yeah. for when they interrupt you and you have to go hide behind a truck yes right yes um what uh so what is your like when you're not not when joseph's fighting but when your friends are fighting when people you love are fighting do you just stay silent and silently pray inside do you not <laughs> i mean you have to look at the fight obviously yeah for sure right? so for sure. how do you handle that well you know at this point between Joseph and myself, mm -hmm. there's like always someone I care about of course. Um, on the card, but usually like every fight I really do. Cause, cause it's even like, whether you know them or not for the amount of research we do, you know, everyone's story. Of and course. traditionally to be an MMA fighter, you don't have like a perfect life. You didn't yeah. come from, you know, this gorgeous, That's you know, right. silver spoon situation. So mm -hmm. while there may be some who are, you know, the the out the outlier to that rule it's it's a challenging thing so for me i i literally just pray all the time mm -hmm. that nobody gets seriously injured and that whoever wins and whoever does not win they're still able to like hold value in themselves find confidence and continue moving forward because unfortunately i think it happens like obviously in team sports and in individual sports but i think even more so in a fight mm -hmm. is that a lot of a lot of our athlete self-worth is determined on the outcome of what's in the octagon. And I think for me, that's so hard to see because I just, they're such wonderful human beings and you don't want them to, to not feel the love and compassion and confidence um, and self-worth mm -hmm. that they should because yeah. of the outcome of a fight where 99.9% .9 of the population will never be brave enough to do that, no. including myself. Um, and so, you know, for me, I'm always just like, I'm literally always praying that like, they'll be okay. And that whatever the outcomes, like it's, it's on, it's God's path, but that they never lose like that feeling of they are loved and like worthy That's because beautiful. yeah, well, it's, it's, it's hard, you know, it's, it's definitely, it's definitely hard when you see like the you know, the way the world can treat people sometimes it's, mm -hmm. it's tough. So that's always my constant prayer. Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, and obviously as media, you're not supposed to cheer, you know, when yeah. you're media. Mm, sure. So I, that was something that I had to, I remember holding back from, you know, if, if a friend of mine was fighting and, you know, he got a really solid, you know, like hook <laughs> in or whatever, I'd be like, yeah. <sighs> like, do you ever, do you, do yeah. you sometimes catch yourself or no, now you're good, I'm probably. so trained by yeah, it. Now um, you're good. Yeah. Even like even when I did watch Joe, like, cause I used to watch him for a long time. I would, yeah. I'd be really good about like not showing emotion. I just like hold my breath. And oh, wow. Like, yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, but it's everybody knows something, but know somebody on the card and like maybe feels closer towards one person than mm -hmm. the other. But I think genuinely like we're all pretty good about like just wanting the best outcome for everybody. Yes. You know what I mean? Like, I don't, I literally don't care who wins any fight except when Joe fights. Yes, like I, I'm of like, course, fine. of course, of <laughs> yeah. course. So, uh, what, so speaking of prayer, what, what part of, what part does prayer and your relationship with God play, not only in your work, but in your personal life? Oh yeah. I mean, it's everything. Like yeah. I am a devout Catholic. Um, I grew up Catholic. I 
choose to be Catholic as an adult because I, you know, believe in the teachings of Jesus, but also in the angels and the saints. Like I am, I'm always praying to saints. Like mm-hmm. I have prayer cards all over. Yes. I've got statues all over my house. Like yes. so very Italian of yes. me, but it's my relationship with God is everything. And, you know, I, there are days I'm mad at him and mm-hmm. there are days I'm, you know, thanking God for my life and, and, you know, and everything in between that you can think of. But I just always feel comfort if I know we're not in this alone. And like, you know, Joe and I pray together a lot. We pray together before and after he fights. And, you know, even when it doesn't go his way, it's still, we have something to be thankful for. And I just feel like so blessed to have the life I do have. And even when, you know, things are good, you're praying and grateful and like, Hey, I know things are good. Like I recognize this, you know, Mm -hmm. and when things are bad, you're like, I know this isn't forever, but just help me get through it. It's I'm, I literally put pray all day, every day. I have this amazing app on my phone that I love called hello. This is not like a plug for them, but okay, um, I have okay. nothing to do, no sponsorship or anything, but yeah. I love them. There's yeah. like crazy novenas on there. Tons of, you can listen to the gospel every day. Oh, it's I'm amazing. Yeah. This. It's, it's so great. Like I do the rosary with them. There's um, like a daily prayer thing. Okay. And it just like in this modern world kind of helps you like ground yourself and I'll walk my dog and listen to it. And it's just, it's really important to me. I try not to ever like shove it down anyone's throat or like, no, you, you don't. know, you never do, but yeah. we've talked about it Yeah, and you've sent me accounts to follow <laughs> yeah. that have been helpful. Yeah. To me. Blessed is she is amazing too. That's a, yes. that's a great account. Yes. And I, I'm glad that you and I have that in common Yeah, because it's, a, it's a huge factor to have in common with a friend. Yeah, for sure. Mm-hmm. And it's somewhat taboo sometimes, it you is. know, and you never want to make someone feel uncomfortable who maybe no. isn't religious or thinks of your particular religion in a negative, in a negative connotation, but it's Mm -hmm. like, you know, it is a part of who I am and it's why I, you know, chose, I never wanted to go. Like I got into Columbia, which is Ivy league, but I wanted to go to Catholic university. So it's just a, it's just a choice that I make to try and be the best version of myself. Low key, low key flex on the Columbia. (laughs) That's right. Low key, high key. Low key, high key, high key. Um, okay. So I know that you memorize a lot of, of what you say, yeah. which is incredible. And I know you get asked a lot about acting, you know, yeah. because that's, that's a skill. I, yeah. for me to memorize something, I remember in 10th grade when I had to memorize, it was like the, the prologue to the Canterbury tales. Oh yeah. Which I can, in, in old English, which I can still say, Oh, right away. This is super random. Yeah. It's really though. random. But the way I remembered it, the way I could recite it was I had to lay on the floor cover my eyes and then I could recite it because I could like see the okay. lines. Okay. So I would never be able to do that. I, I would have to be on the fly. Of course, you've had a lot of practice to do yeah. this. Um, but when you do the big sit downs, like with Connor and Dustin, mm-hmm. like the ones you did recently, you know, that's probably most prevalent in people's minds. Do you memorize all of your questions? Do you kind of go in with more of a story, kind of a flowy format for those? What do you do? Yeah. So that's a good question. So interviews are totally different than how I do my reports. Okay. Because everything I do is memorized. We have no tele, in the world of UFC, that no teleprompters exist. Yes. For, for sit down interviews, I do a tremendous amount of research. Of I think it's always I would rather be like, oh, I didn't use any of the eight hours of prep I did than be like, <laughs> oh my God, I had yeah. no idea what, what he was talking about yes. in reference to this. So what I do is as I'm doing research, I take notes on the things that I think are important or things mm-hmm. I want to follow up on or whatever. And then I kind of make an outline of if in a perfect world, we sit down and I can ask him everything I want. This is the order of questioning I want to go in. And that is, there's sort of an art to it. It's like, it's like making a road. And you have to know that sometimes you might go left or right and you're no longer going straight. And how do you get back to those questions you have to ask? But I do, it, I wouldn't even say it's memorizing because it's, it's just the fact that you've learned all of this mm-hmm. about the person, or you want to make sure you're be- you're giving them a platform to tell that story. So mm-hmm. I do, I do come in with notes sometimes yeah. um, to make sure like, especially should there be other factors in play, like, oh, sponsorship needs this question, or we need this question for countdown, whatever that that's sort of like a different animal, but it's, it's really about just your, your study on the subject, because if you have done the work and the research, sure, there might be a thing or two you're not going to remember, but when they're sitting across from you, you can just listen then. You don't have to be worried about like, wait, and what is this referencing? You know what I mean? You can really make sure that you know what's going on. So it's a lot of prep work. Yeah. It could be hours of prep for a 10 minute interview. Like it was for Dustin Poirier. I mean, and I know Dustin well, I've been, I've worked with him since WC, but it's like, there's still something to be learned. They're still living their life every day. Mm -hmm. 
So it was probably like, I don't know, like a whole entire day when you add up all the, all the hours over the weeks that I did. And then we did a 10 minute interview, Yeah, but it was worth it. You know, I didn't feel like a second of that was wasted. So it's definitely, I would say it's more about the work than memorization, but I do like, like to bring a note card of, especially if there's, like I said, there's certain things I have to hit. I like to just have them so that I can go, oh, you know what? We forgot this or yes. whatever, just to make sure we cover all of our bases. Yesterday evening, I was interviewing a, um, this couple, they're beautiful. They're called at compass.couple on Instagram. Okay. And it was funny because I obviously wanted to ask them about travel tips because they literally have lived around the world. Oh, amazing. We didn't even get there. <laughs> we spoke for two hours and we didn't even get there. And I, after I hung up with them, I was like, I didn't fucking ask them about <laughs> travel tips. Like we had so much else to talk yeah, about. You exactly. Know? That's exactly so how it goes. I was, and I even, I mean, like I even had it bullet pointed and then for some reason we just gabbed. Yeah. And then when it got to the two hour mark, I was like, so, and they, they're living, they live in, in yeah, they live in Bali right now. Oh so they're like 14 hours. What a nice time. For ahead. Them. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, they, they're like 14 hours ahead, but it was already, you know, 10 o'clock here. And oh, just yeah. Like, so we're going to wrap it up. Yeah. But they were so cool. I, you should check them out. I, I think you like them. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. I think you Look like at them. you interviewing people in Bali. Okay. International yes. step. <laughs> oh, my God. But they are so sweet. They went to the same high school in Colorado and then never met. Same, same class. What? Same high school. Never met. And then met up like randomly in Amsterdam, randomly in Amsterdam. That's fate. Yeah. That's like God being like, Hey, you guys miss each other. Bring yes. Me back. <laughs> yes. So now when they go back home, you know, they, their family is like two minutes away from one another. That's amazing. Isn't that cool? I love that. Okay. I'm going to follow them. They, you should. They're amazing. <laughs> um, okay. So let's see what else here. Um, da, 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 I talked about that. I love the notes. This is yes. so good. Yes. I know. I know. I need them because I have so many things I want to ask you. Um, so when you, and I know this because I, say last night after I recorded the, the podcast, I was up, right? You get up because you have the energy, yeah. your adrenaline going. Yeah. So after a night of fights, especially a really ex exhilarating card, yeah. right? And you're just up. So when you drive home, how do you freaking unwind to close your eyes? Yeah. Well, first I get food. Yeah. <laughs> so that's number one. Yeah. What, what's your go-to? Do you have go-to? Um, yeah. Usually Roberto's tacos, okay. hard shell chicken yep. tacos. Got to do Roberto's. Um, yeah. So I usually get that. Um, I talk, if, if Joe, Joe's either with me or I like call him because he always watches the fights, but right. a lot of times he's with me. So we kind of dissect our nights because they are like I'm kind of all over the place. Yep. And then it probably, it honestly probably only takes me like an hour. I take off all my makeup and yes. shower. Yeah. And then I, our days are so long. Like there mm -hmm. are, there are times where like, for instance, UFC 264, I got in the building at like 10 AM and I left the building at almost midnight. So they're long days and physically they're exhausting. You're, you're in heels, you're running around an entire arena. So I just kind of like get in bed and just chill. And we, okay. we usually watch like a Netflix show or something, okay. an episode of whatever we're watching at that time. And then I'm like, bro, I, then I'm like out. I'm like, yeah. bro, I'm going to bed. Bye. Cause you get so overstimulated. It is. It's so much. And I think the mental, the mental aspect for someone like me, who also has to like, make sure I'm memorizing stuff, but yeah. then going back and forth to interviews and yeah. other hits that we have. Um, it's, it's a lot of the mental exhaustion is what's tiring. Cause I'm like being up for eight hours of a live broadcast is more draining than like, you know, running miles and miles and miles because your, your body and brain don't get a break. I agree. Yeah. And I think it's the smartest thing you ever did to get a double earpiece. So you don't hear anything. Oh my God. Well, one of our shows, I think it was Australia. Yeah, it was, it was Australia. I want to say it was style bender versus Robert Whitaker. Yeah. I only had one and I missed cues because the wow. arena was so well, loud. Whitaker, obviously. Yeah. yeah. And it was so crazy loud that I couldn't hear the count. <sighs> no. So oh finally I was like, um, do you, do you guys have like a way to help this? Because they were like, I was, I think if you watch it back, I was late for like several yeah. seconds Yeah, and not because I wasn't paying attention because I genuinely couldn't, couldn't hear. hear. Um, and so having doubles just like helps in an yes. arena setting, like tomorrow night, it will be amazing. Yes. I, NFL games. It's so helpful because oh, 
they're tremendously loud between the action on the field and the crowd and it just it does make people think I'm a bitch because they yeah. think I'm like walking by without saying hi Megan. yeah and I'm like oh and they're clear so you can't really see them but um yeah no it's the greatest thing of yeah, my life like I course. don't know what I would do I just got my wires replaced yeah yeah and it and people also don't understand with live tv your producers are constantly like hey um we're changing this or we're doing this can you yeah. do this now what about this can you do that so there's a huge communication if you can't hear them or communicate with with your talk back. That's why I always have a mic on me and I mm-hmm. always have my ears in because you have, that's like your telephone, that's your yeah. cell phone, but it's immediate instead. Yeah. yeah. Have you ever had an embarrassing moment on camera where like you had something in your teeth <laughs> or like um, your dress was caught in your underwear or something? Yeah. Well, like, I mean, like every time I watch, I'm like, oh God, that's embarrassing. But um, <laughs> no, I can just remember Thank one God. time. Yeah. <laughs> I can just remember one time, one time we filmed something. This was a few years ago. We filmed something by the octagon because I, I think it was one of those weekends where we had multiple fights in a weekend. So we had like a weigh in and then a fight was starting immediately after. Okay. I filmed something from the way in they were going to put in the beginning of the show. I don't usually pre-tape stuff, but that mm-hmm. was pre-taped um, because I needed like a buffer zone to get to the fight. Okay. And so we filmed something and people text me. They're like, hey, for your next hit, like you have makeup, you have lipstick on your chin. No. <laughs> and I was like, well, that was taped and not one person told me about it. So I had like bright red lipstick Why? like right here. And I'm like, Cool. Y'all tell her. I know. Well, tell now her. I'm always like, is there anything on my face? Yeah. Oh, that's good. <laughs> yeah. I, that's right. But that's one of my faults um, that I find I do when I'm in front of the camera is I do, I do this. Oh, constantly. I'm constantly touching my hair. Doing yeah. this at all times. And I'm like, stop. Like when I watch it, I'm like, stop it. Stop it. Stop. 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 stop, stop. It's a tip. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, we, we all have them. And I yeah. work really hard to not do mine. I do touch my hair. I'll, yeah. Before I go live, I'll touch my hair like 15 times. Yeah. Like, oh is, it, is it straight? It's always it's separating. Okay. <laughs> Literally the perfect haircut for you. It's so pretty. <laughs> and you have such great fa- fashion sense oh, too. Thanks. I try. I watched the Mystic Hour. Oh, uh-huh. yeah. yeah. He did a great job interviewing you. I, I yeah, like Yeah. He's really good. He's really um, good. What's his name? Um, he Daniel? is. Yeah. Uh, what's his we name on this? Out, but I think it's like darn out his something. name on Instagram is uh is he just like black is he an aspiring journalist yes okay okay yes I like I'm Miami I like him a lot yeah. so uh yeah when I watched that he was talking about your fashion and he like showed some pictures <laughs> yeah, yeah. of your matador outfit yeah. and then there was the spice girls oh and, yeah but that was really that was a cool segment that he did it was fun it was I fun. liked that we'll but post- do you do you plan like do you plan your outfits oh yeah okay. because because man, the internet cares. Oh, they, they really care. Yeah. And really it do. is the most stressful part of my job is picking my outfits. Well, that, remember that green suit that I loved and yeah. you're like, everyone hated it. I'm like, how? Oh, in Arizona. Yeah. 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 Ever, they, I, they were like, oh, she's sexy Gumby. I'm like, well, at least it was sexy. I let, well, <laughs> hey, that's sexy. We'll, take, we'll take that. Take sexy. Um, no. So it's, it's challenging. There's also a lot of rules uh, when you are on camera because the way the camera picks certain things up, certain colors, certain patterns. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of things that will look amazing in real life, but like will not translate on yeah. camera and vice versa. There's some things that look great on camera and you're like, oh my God, why would yeah. you wear that in real life? Yes. It's it's hard. It's fun. My husband and I love fashion. And yes. so like he'll yeah, help Joseph's me. Joseph's got a very Joe, good fashion Oh my God. Too. Yeah. Dapper scrappers. I mean, he is, he is yeah, just so we good. We love dapper scrappers. Yeah, he's the best. And so we'll, I'll like get a bunch of options and then we'll have like a fashion show. That's what I call yes. it. I'm like, okay, it's time for the fashion show. And oh, he'll help me pick that's outfits. Cute. But I try to, I try to like always dress like in a way, like people can buy the stuff because yeah. like it's, it's a big thing for me. I see people on TV and I like want their outfit, mm-hmm. but then when I'm like, oh, it's $900 for that blazer. No, mm-hmm. thank you. Um, so like I wore this purple suit that was, um, that's yeah, cool. that was from ASOS. It was literally like $35 for the whole suit. Loved it. But yeah. And Jared Leto stole, I know, stole, your, stole my look. Yeah, your look. <laughs> I saw him at the fight and I was going to show him the picture of the side-by-side of us. And I was like, no, nah, he probably won't be into that. <laughs> <laughs> he has longer hair than you. Yeah, so. he does. He does. And better skin. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. No way. Well, the other thing is I don't know I told you this I don't know how the heck you walk in those shoes all day oh yeah I have no idea Mm. I would die uh yeah it's it's just become like a second nature well because everyone is taller than me everyone I'm only five feet tall so like everyone is taller than me and so it just becomes a, a thing and then you know I 
I think we are held to a standard. Like if people see us in the crowd, they don't want us to be like schlubs, yeah, you know? So I don't want to like misrepresent our brand in any way of, of like, course. oh, okay, well, she's just like walking around like a slob. So I am always trying to like make sure I'm what's like the most professional way I can carry myself throughout the evening. And that's mm-hmm. keep my shoes on, but even though I don't yeah. want to sometimes. Do Britney Spears and <laughs> yeah, exactly. the gas station bathroom. Exactly, exactly. So we love Brittany. you, Brittany, anyways. <laughs> Free Brittany. <laughs> For sure. Uh, no, but I, you know, it's, I know you don't like social media, but you are an influencer, uh, you know, thanks. you yeah. are, but you yeah. are. And so the things that you wear, you're right. People are going to want to know yeah. where you got it, how to get it. Um, and so I think that's really awesome that you're wearing things that are attainable for people. Yeah. Well, like the jacket I'm wearing on Saturday would normally be expensive, but I got on clearance. Nice. Yeah. And so like, that's a big thing for me. I'm like, Mm. I'm not paying full price for anything. Like the real, real, like, Ah, oh my God, I get so much stuff there. Uh Um, because I think it's like, also, I, I just think like the way we use fashion to be able to like, kind of be good to the environment with it and stuff is great. And also like, I'm not paying full price for something. I'm probably going to wear one time because when oh, I wear right. it again, I get called out. Of course. So like, I, I've like repeated a shirt before, like that I wore to interview Connor Jeez. and then I heard about it. I'm like, oh my God, that was literally four years ago, but okay. <laughs> but meanwhile, we're wearing the same thing four days in a row out here <laughs> in the real world. Okay. Yeah, I haven't washed my hair. Like it's fine. <laughs> yeah. No, haven't showered in two days. It's totally fine. <laughs> Just kidding. Just kidding. I showered yesterday. Okay. I showered twice yesterday because I'm like really weird about, about when I get off planes, I have to shower immediately. I do too. And, and I heard you wear, you wore masks before it was cool. Oh, I and would, I did the same. Yeah. Because it's, people are gross. People, yeah. People are disgusting Yeah, and people would look at me crazy. Uh-huh, they didn't want to sit by you. It was the yeah, best. Yeah. And even when I worked in corporate, like corporate hospitality, I remember when I was sick, I would wear masks to work as a courtesy and right. people would like avoid me like the plague. Yeah. You're like, that's fine. That's cool. <laughs> I'm like, yes. But now if you wear a mask, people want us the next year. You're like, oh, damn. I was just talking to some of my colleagues um, and I was telling them how it used to be my Southwest trick. So oh. I, the reason I started wearing masks is we went, we had a show in Singapore. Uh-huh. I landed and was deathly ill because we were on yes, an airline that maybe wasn't like super hygienic mm-hmm. and, you know, germ friendly and so I saw the doctor there and she was like you need to wear a mask that's why we do this like and it's to help protect you but it's also to protect others should you be sick yeah and so that was almost 10 years ago and I always wore a mask but when I wore it on southwest where it's open seating (laughs) I I would be the if there was if there was going to be an open middle seat it was next to me Ah! because nobody wanted to sit next to the girl with a mask on there must be something like terribly wrong with her and I'm like now now do I reverse it do I not wear a mask yeah like no one will sit next to me like what's the vibe they kick you off the plane right exactly exactly so yeah it used to be my used to be my my little trick and now it's no (laughs) (laughs) so I want to ask you two MMA related questions okay one is a lot of times people ask me who are your favorite MMA fighters this is like a typical question yeah and I'm like, that answer's twofold because for me, I think the two people that impacted MMA the most and my two favorite fighters are two different things. Sure. And so I always bring up Rhonda and I bring up Connor. And you in your interview, I think it was the residency podcast. Yeah, those guys are great. Wow, that was a great podcast, guys, by the way. Yeah, they're awesome. You should you should check them out. They're yeah. in Vegas. They're yeah. the greatest. They seem super cool. So chill. They yeah. all have like really cool side gigs. Cool. Yeah, like one of the guys is unlocked. Um, oh. he, he's like a food account on uh, Instagram for okay. Vegas. Mm, and yeah, we they, love food. Yeah. 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 They're love awesome. Um, so I remember you saying that your career changed with the Ronda revolution yeah. and with Connor. Yep. And I specifically remember all of a sudden, you know, my little underground MMA, you know, career and my love of MMA, all of a sudden, all of my friends were talking about Connor McGregor, like they were experts Yeah. and Rhonda, like they hated her and they couldn't believe she was such a and all this stuff. And I was like, do you know that she is playing her part so well that yeah. she has you thinking all these things? Yeah. And same thing with Connor. I'm like, that's why Connor gets paid because he talks and he hypes up the fight. Yeah. And that's why they, they bring in the big bucks. So um, I'm, I was glad to hear you say that. Uh, so now I can win a lot of arguments, um, <laughs> you know, that they really revolutionized um, MMA. So do you have any comments about, yeah. about those two? Yeah. I mean, I literally, my life changed when Rhonda 
and I did an interview because I, I work for UFC. So sometimes there are just things that I get the opportunity to do yep. because I work for the organization. Mm-hmm. And so I, you know, we had done a couple of interviews. I had interviewed her when she was at Tough Enough. I think it was tough enough. And um, so I, we kind of knew of each other and then I did some interviews and she really enjoyed them. And she told her team like, Hey, I really, you know, I'd like working with her. So her agent ended up reaching out. He's now my agent. Um, We're we're part of my team and we did all these interviews and I got to go to like Saturday night live with her. And I got to do all these things because she trusted me. And I think there's a lot to be said about like conducting yourself in that way. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, there's, there's a, definitely a place for, you know, journalism that gets to the bottom of things and, and of has all of that, but that's not the way I like to storytell. I like to make sure like it's in the athlete's hands. And she was really good about like knowing she had these massive fights and these high profile spots and being like, yeah, I'll do the interview with Megan, mm-hmm. you know, and that matters. And it matters, especially to a young woman in the industry who, you know, yes, was doing all the other interviews, but when the superstar is willing to grant you that access huge yeah and then it was on me to not fuck it up and you know so I was I was really lucky and I I just saw Rhonda the other day and I literally like had tears in my eyes she's so cute and pregnant and I was just like I love you and like we 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 have this like absolute like admiration for one another that will never go away and the same with Connor like he did not need to always allow me the access Mm -hmm. after he's done hours and hours of work yeah um the the amount that stars like that go through on on every day especially on a fight week is crazy just the the amount of responsibilities and obligations is is insane and he he made a point to be like yeah I'll still do Megan's interview and like yeah and it's 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 huge you know it's without those opportunities I don't know what my voice would look like in Mm -hmm. terms of like how big or small it is because it does take two, like you have to get those big interviews. You have to be mm-hmm. able to then do them well and like get something out of them that other people can't. And so to, for Rhonda and Connor to allow me to have that, that place in their lives is, is huge. And it literally changed my life. Like people who don't watch the sport, like my NFL colleagues, they don't really watch, but they watch Connor. Everybody said something to me when I just saw them, they were like, they were like, Oh my God, we saw your interview before. And then we saw you during his fight. Oh my God. And it's like, guys, I work every Saturday, but yeah. okay. you know, but like for them that they're noticing and they're, you know, hall of fame football players. And yeah. they're like, Oh my God, that was so cool. Yeah. You no, know, it matters. It yeah. matters. And for us, it's like, I try to treat everybody equally, every person on our roster, but it matters to people. And, and so mm-hmm. it gave me opportunities and open doors for me that maybe, you know, wouldn't have or mm-hmm. wouldn't have as soon. And mm-hmm. I, I owe them a lot. Yeah, definitely. I, I was at uh, Rhonda's first um, UFC debut when she fought Liz. Yeah. And I made a point to be there because I had loved her since Strike Force. And I was just like, Dana literally said no women in UFC. And here we are. And I just, I had to be there because I was yeah. like, this is a momentous occasion. History. Yeah. Absolutely. By the way, it was also incidentally the last time I wore heels to a fight. <laughs> yeah. Because mm-hmm. that arena had no handrails. I'll just let you know. Oh my I'll God. Worse. Yeah. I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It is the, the worst. Honda Center. The it was worst. Rhonda at the Honda. There's, I, there's actually like, I feel like a ton of arenas like that. I'm always like, I'm going to die. This is the time where I fall down the steps on air. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I I will never wear and honestly now I'm the girl who who wears athleisure to a fight like I used to dress up and then I'm like who's gonna really see me I don't really no there's like there's like several different groupings of like what people wear it's like one is like I think a fighter's gonna see me in the crowd and like marry me right and then there's like oh I'm just like having a good time and I like to look cute and then it's like I just want to be comfortable like there's like three different layers of three tiers (laughs) of that yeah definitely so do you have any super memorable I mean there's so many so so obviously this question is loaded, but do you have any super memorable or vivid memories of, you know, certain fights that really stand out to you? Because there's a couple of fights that to me, I'm just like, I'll never forget them. Do you yeah. have any moments like that? Yeah, definitely. I mean, speaking about Conor McGregor, definitely Conor versus Jose. Oh. <laughs> Less Woo! than 20 seconds that it lasted, oh but I did the world tour with them. Yes. I, you know, I was a part of the lead up. And then I remember we were standing in the arena yeah. and Connor knocked out Jose. And then I remember standing with some of my colleagues who worked in the PR department. And then we just looked at each other and they're like, run. And we ran <laughs> backstage because beers started like flying. Oh my it kind of took, everybody was kind of stunned for like five or 10 seconds. Right, right. And then they were just like, go. So we like yeah. sprinted backstage. 
I mean, there's just been some epic battles. Like I remember Shogun Dan Henderson. That was in oh, San Jose. Yeah. That was like, I just remember being like, holy shit. Yeah. I remember the Anthony Pettis. I was cage side for the WC Showtime kick. Yes. And I just remember being like, what did I just see? That's yeah. historic. Ah, yeah. 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 And, and it still is to this day when it, probably the yeah. most played highlights of all time. For sure. Yeah. And then, you know, Rhonda's arm breaking oh of my. people. Yeah. I just, I just, all of those things are kind of burned into my brain. I, I always feel like I should sit down and really think about it and like I know. make a list. It's, yeah. Um, but then I forget. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. I mean, there's, there's so many times that I've just been like, what? And just like ran around the living room by myself, yes. just like ah, freaking yeah. out. Um, yeah. there's some pretty show-stopping moments. Yeah, and there's sure. honestly been some moments where I, and I know that they don't do it on purpose, but I've been really disappointed that the fight didn't go yeah. you know, even to one round. Yeah. Um, I was in Vegas for a card. Derek was fighting on the card. Um, I think he was fighting. What's his name? The He was a heavyweight and he was like, like a little bit older, had a mullet, really big guy. Right now, Yes. He was fighting Roy Nelson. Oh my God. I was like totally blanking there. <laughs> so he was fighting Roy Nelson on that card. And I remember I had a friend on the card named Mitch Clark and he was fighting yeah. and literally within the first 15 seconds, um, something happened where his knee gave out. Like, oh, I shoot. don't, I don't remember what happened, but I ended up leaving the fights, going with him to like some shitty Vegas hospital. And like, there was, you know, a bunch of other fighters there from getting their injuries. And I was just like, oh man, it was such a letdown because I know he, like he went to Jackson's for his camp and like really spent so much time. And, and after that, he was like, I think I'm done. And I was like, don't just don't say that now. Just wait a couple weeks. Tough. It's really tough. Um, It's so hard. Yeah. It's, it's, the highest highs and literally the lowest of the lows. Yes. And you sometimes it's totally out of the athlete's yeah. control. Sometimes it's like this freak thing or yeah. you can have, you can just have a bad day. Yeah. You know, it yeah, just, of course, you know, we all have bad days, but of like course. if you have a bad day in the octagon, it, it's for a, everyone yeah. to see. Exactly. Exactly. So I have one more question for you. Okay. And oh I ask gosh, everybody yes. on this podcast this okay. one question. Okay. So if you were to be walking down the street and you see 20 year old Megan Olivia walking yeah. towards you yeah. and you're like, oh my God, I'm going to go get, give her a big hug. Yeah. And you embrace her and you just like look at her. And what is the piece of advice or the one thing that you say to 20 year old Megan? Oh my gosh. That's a really good question. <laughs> It'll all work out. Okay. I think, I think that's the thing because life is so unpredictable. Work is so unpredictable. Things are so unpredictable, but like literally marrying Joe and like having that next to me means like it will never be bad, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think when I was 20, you know, I was, I I was on and off with a high school, uh, sweetheart and Mm -hmm. things were crazy. And I was kind of like feeling like a bad person for wanting to pursue this particular path. Yeah. And I remember just like thinking like, what if I'm making the wrong choice? And, and, you know, should I really be doing this for me? Like I should worry about other people. And I think that's what I would tell myself. Like it's all going to be okay. And like, you know, I, I'm not that I've ever been cocky, but I've always believed in myself. Like my parents always kind of were like, Hey, you can do whatever you want to do. Like you just have to work super hard at it. So that was always there, but I think I always felt like I owed other people instead of myself, you know, and I, that guilt would eat at me for a long time. Um, Mm -hmm. It's hard to be away from my parents. And that's really hard. That's like a a thing I carry around a lot, but in terms of when I was 20, for sure, it was like, like, it's going to be okay. And like, you have to do this for you because I would a lot of times make decisions based on other people's happiness instead of my own. And that like, wasn't the move. <laughs> yes, definitely. Well, you have definitely given us so much juicy information oh and I've loved having you on the podcast. This is the best. Thanks for yeah, coming here. She came course. all the way to me. I'm here yeah. in some like dingy. Yeah, we're room. here. We actually didn't hit record before this, but it's, the, it's <laughs> UFC. What is it? Two, 265. UFC 265. Yeah. And it's here in Houston. So we got the opportunity to actually be together. This is amazing. It's so nice. Um, And she came all the way down here and yeah. you're doing, you're you're doing what people dream of doing. You're taking the risk and it's scary. And I know that everybody like thinks they can do it or wants to do it, but to actually do it and put it into practice is a totally different thing. So I hope like you're so proud of yourself and you know, like how much people can take from this because it's, it's not an easy thing to do and put yourself in a vulnerable, vulnerable position and really lay it all out there and just Mm -hmm. say like, I'm going to try. And like, that's the hardest part is to like make the decision to try and you're killing it. Thank you. And you're po- like, I can't get over her podcast voice. Do you oh. do voiceover work? You wow. should. <laughs> Thank you so much. You really, I feel like you should like sign up as a voiceover actor. Really okay. Nice. Yeah. Well, I might, I might just do that. Yeah. Uh, maybe I'll do like a, you know, 1-800 
operator thing. Yeah, too. no, no, no. Yeah, Why whatever. <laughs> um, no, I just, I, you know, I really want to do something that's going to help women our age, like from twenties to forties, really, yeah. because I, I feel like there's nobody to like slip on the banana peel for you. And I want to do that for other women. So they don't have to do that. They don't yeah. have to go through those steps and they just can get the information they need right from me. Yeah. Like right from the source. So they don't have to go out and, and Google and find yeah, things out for, for themselves. For sure. For sure. And yeah. like, and to speak to people from all different walks of life, yes. it helps because you don't always get to interact with them and you only see yep. the glimmer that people let you see on social media. And that's not real life, you no. know? So to be able to have a real conversation and, and get that input, that's so special and important. What's real life is we have no real light in this room. And that's why it's a little grainy. <laughs> and I haven't washed my hair or really put on makeup. So hi. Hello. But we're going to make it work. I'll look so glamorous on Saturday. You won't know me because we have a makeup artist. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Yes. You have a makeup artist. Oh, I wish I had one. Yeah. No, you don't need one. Well, I let, I, put, I put on makeup today for Megan. Oh, thanks. So, yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> so if you're watching on YouTube, like, com like, comment, and subscribe. Don't forget to hit the notification bell. Also, if you are listening on a streaming platform, leave me a review. If not, I'm just happy that you're here, honestly. Um, so we will see you on the next one. Thank you guys for watching, for listening. Megan, thank you again oh, for being with me. Yes, and I love you guys, and I love you. Oh, I love you. Love All you right, guys. we'll see you on the next one. <laughs> Bye. That's a wrap for this episode of The Luxury Dropout. Make sure to visit stephaniejoplin.com to find all of Steph's episodes, including full podcast descriptions and photos of her guests. Until next time, besties.